Amen. You can be seated. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, third service. Love it. Hey, if you're a guest, my name is Nick. I actually am the pastor. So uh, we are so glad you're here today. want to welcome all those watching online, too. We really do believe church should be relevant, simple, and real. And today is no different. Before I jump into the message, I want to update you kind of on our bold. We've been doing that every single week. And really, today's message is I just want to say thank you. Last week, I asked everybody to grab one of these as a prayer list and kind of pray through this. And we had some dominoes and we did some things that needed to happen for us to be able to open July 1st. And I just want you to know that so many of these were answered, that really, we still got some stuff. I still want to encourage you, pray through this, pray with us, partner with us. But I really do believe that when when God's people come together and humble themselves, when they really do come together and, and, and speak to God and just beseech upon him to kind of bless us, it happens. And this past week was awesome. And we got three weeks left. Not that I'm counting, but three, one, two, three, and we're done. Actually, seven services. So that's where I'm at. Actually, you guys are at weeks. I'm at services, okay? So I got one more and then three and three. So I got seven services left. Uh, it's going to be an incredible weekend uh, but we just got a lot of work to do. So please pray for us, pray for the building, pray for the, just all the stuff that needs to happen. There's a lot of stuff converging together, and it is wonderful, wonderful, good, good problems that we've got going on. And so anyway, thank you so much. Continue to pray for us. With that said, we are in the middle of a series entitled Acts 29. And this whole series, I kind of stepped back, and it's very uncharacteristic for us. I kind of stepped back and said, you know what? I need to prepare our church for what's about to happen, that, that we need to get ready for what I believe is going to be a flood of people who need to hear the gospel, who need to hear about Jesus. And so we are ta taking this series and we are looking at the first church, the, the church at its purest form, at its most genuine form, and trying to figure out what we can learn. Because what we said, and the reason we call it Acts 29 is this. But if you look at the book of Acts, it's the history, it's the story, it was what was written about the first church, and it's 28 chapters long. And then we've got the epistles, which were letters written to other churches at the same time that Acts was happening, so it's not new stories, it's just kind of the same time as Acts 1 through 28. And then we have the book of Revelation, which is the end. And so there's this massive gap in between Acts 28 and Revelation, and we are living in this Acts 29 kind of time period. We, we are living in the gap. And what we said last week was this, that we aspire, I hope you aspire, to be a story worth reading. That someday your obituary or whatever it is that's written about you, that people either decide whether you are worth reading or not. As we read the first church, it's worth reading, isn't it? And that we, we aspire to be a church that years and years from now that people would read about River Lake Church, that people would read about the, the people of River Lake Church, that our stories, our faith, would be so inspired. It would be such a movement of God that started in the small city in Glasgow, Kentucky, that people would read and go, wow, look what God did through average, ordinary people. That, that is our hope. And we talked about that last week, and we looked at a man named Peter. We looked at it, and we said, listen, in the Gospels, he was kind of a zero. And Acts chapter 2, something incredible happened, and he became the hero. He became the rock. He became the thing that people named their cathedrals after, named their kids after. Like, he changed the landscape of the church. And something happened in Acts chapter 2, and we talked about the fact that they came together. A small group of people came together, bound together, and prayed. And in that moment, God's Holy Spirit filled them. And Peter all of a sudden became bold. And Peter all of a sudden preached the best sermon in the world, and 3,000 people came to know who Jesus was in that moment. That's a great day for a church. And the first church was a megachurch. And it started this movement that changed the history of the world. It's an incredible, incredible start. And we're going to continue it today. If you've got a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 4. But before we get there, i got an incredibly important question to ask you really quickly. How many people have ever lost something in their life? Just raise, raise your hand really high. Be proud. It's okay if you lost something. Yeah, keep them up real quick. No, just keep them up. Don't, don't let people. Okay. How many of you have ever lost your keys? Okay. How many of you have ever lost, like, money? How many of you have ever lost a child? Oh, it's just me. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for making me feel good. Yeah, you should have seen your face. Everybody's like, ah. No, no, not me. Like, sh shut up. No, that doesn't count. Like, you know, like, no, so I have. I've lost my children. I have five. I really love my wife. I have five kids, okay, and I've lost them more than once, unfortunately. I don't know why my wife keeps trusting me with them. I keep telling her not to, but 
She does. And I have lost my kids. I have lost keys. I have lost money. I have lost my children. I've lost about everything. I am about as space cadet as you can get. And I've lost everything. But let me tell you what has never happened when I've lost anything important to me, whether it be my car keys and I need to leave for a moment, whether it be some some money, maybe I've lost $100 bills before and I'm like, man, I don't know what to do with that. Or, Or maybe it's I've lost my kids, which I have done that. I've never paused and thought, you know what, hold up. I am not qualified to look for my children. I've never taken a class on that. I've never, I've thought, let me think about this. No, I mean, there's police officers who've done that, and there's private detectives who've taken classes and have the right equipment and whatever. Like, I've never paused and thought, I don't know if I'm qualified to do this. I've never thought to myself, you know what? I don't know if I have enough time. I mean, we're at the park today, and I got a pretty full day, and I got to get to work, and I got to check these emails. I've never thought to myself, you know, I don't know if I have time. I've never felt like I lacked the time. I never felt like I lacked the qualification. I never felt like I lacked the education or the experiences. Matter of fact, I never felt anything other than I've got to find what I'm looking for. And here's where we're going to go today. Here's where we're going to unpack this statement right here. That when what is lost is important, what is lacking is irrelevant. When what is lost to you, whether it be your keys, your child, your money, whatever that is, whatever, whatever's lost, maybe it's a relationship, maybe, maybe, I don't know what it is, whatever is lost, if it's important enough to you, if you have passion around it, what you're lacking really becomes irrelevant. And you get that. You never question whether you're the right person to find your quick keys. You just do it. You never question whether you're the right person, you have to take a class or whatever to find your money. You just do it. Why? Because when what is lost is important. What is lacking, whatever you lack, what is experience, education, time, charisma, talent, giftedness, whatever you lack, really becomes irrelevant. And today, I want to unpack a topic that I think we get that in every other arena of life except for this one, that somewhere along the way, I don't know if it was Satan, I don't know if it was me, I don't know, kind of, maybe it was you or there's this movement, I don't know what happen. I just know that you get that statement. That statement's not deep. You get it in every arena. Like nobody wrote that statement down. Nobody's like, well, that was deep. Like nobody did that. You get it in every arena except, except when it comes to reaching lost people for God. That you get that, and yet when it comes to evangelism, and that's a fancy word, isn't it? We, fancy word's got a whole bunch of history behind it, a whole bunch of kind of expectation behind it. That you get it when it comes to your keys and your kids and your money and your other stuff. But when it comes to lost people in the world, all of a sudden, if you're like me, and I believe you are because I've been a pastor for many, many years and I've heard all the, all the issues. All of a sudden, people will look at me and say things like, Nick, I, I, mean, I know I should. I don't know if I have the right education, though. Like, I don't know. What if they ask me a question? What if I don't have the right answers? What if I don't have the right kind of kind of knowledge behind it? I don't, I've never been to, like, you're a pastor. Like, you're a professional Christian. Like, you should go talk to them. You should go do that. I don't have the right expectations. Or, or they'll say things like, Nick, I just, I'm so busy. I lack time. I mean, I got this job. I got this other thing like that. And you want me to take time out? And we're going to go down here. And we're going to witness. We're going to vanish. Like, no, no, no. Or, or it's, some, some of it, it's, I don't have the right, background. If you only knew my past, Nick, okay, if you just knew kind of my experiences, where I've been and what I've been addicted to or what I said or what I didn't do or what I've done, what I've done or what people know about me, if you just knew my past and you, Nick, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I, I just, all of a sudden, all of a sudden when it comes to reaching what is, what is lost by God, we start to set expectations up upon ourselves that we have no expectation for anything else that we search for in life. And part of it is because we have confused this word evangelism. We have confused what it means and what it should be. Because at the end of the day, all evangelism means, I'm just going to unpack for you, is to passionately share your love for something. That's it. To passionately share your, like, man, you do this, I do this. Like, let me just play a little game, okay? Don't let me down. Second service was killer, so no expectations. But if you mess it up, you're no longer going to be my favorite service. So anyway, okay, real quick. What is my favorite restaurant? Yeah, see, all God's people said amen. Yeah, Chick-fil-A. You know how you know that? Because I evangelized to that place. They have some Jesus chicken that you need to eat. It will make your day better. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, except on Sundays, which makes me cry. But anyway, that's a different story. No, you know that. Why? Because I evangelize people about chicken all the time. 
I evangelize. Come on, second test, real quick. This is a little, a little bit harder, but I believe in you. Come on, come on, come on. Don't let me down. What is my favorite dessert? Oreos. Oreos. Yes, Jesus loves Oreos. They are little drops of heaven, okay? Love Oreos. Could get fat on Oreos. Somebody who desperately loves Jesus and me brought me cherry Coke flavored Oreos. They were a little different, but I liked them, okay? They're Oreos, okay? It's cool. Like, love Oreos. You know how you know that about me? I talk about them all the time. See, will you evangelize what you're passionate about? And you, you were made, whether you want to believe it or not, you were made to evangelize. You were made to be passionate about something. You sell what you love all the time. You talk about your favorite movies. Oh, you got to check out this movie. Oh, I went to the movie and it was great. And da, 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 da. You're passionate about your favorite food. Oh, so-and-so cooked this for me and so-and-so did this. You're passionate about your favorite political uh, affiliation. You're passionate about so many different things. You evangelize all the time. And in none of those cases do you ever pause and go, you know what, I really want to tell them about this movie, but I don't know if I have all the answers. I don't know if I figured out the ending. I don't know if I had the experiences. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have the right background in cinematography. I mean, there were some shots I didn't quite know. Like, you never do that. See, when you're passionate about something, when you're passionate about something, you just evangelize. You just share it. And somewhere along the way, and I'm not quite sure, and I'm not smart enough to kind of unpack it all. I just kind of know the solution, I think, to it. Somewhere along the way, we put unrealistic expectations of ourselves and what it means to be a part of the great commission. That in scripture, what it says is pretty clear that everyone, and I'm so passionate about this, everyone spends eternity somewhere. And we live in a city. We have people in our families and friends and our jobs. And maybe even we have people in this auditorium right now who are lost who what scripture would say that, you know what, there, we live in a lost and dying world, that there are two groups of people, that there are people that are found, that they would say, yeah, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus and I've put my faith in him. And there are people that are lost, that they are broken. They, are, they have lost marriages and lost relationships and lost addictions. And they are lost. And God, this is the most incredible thing in my mind. God, in his infinite wisdom and grace and mercy, partners with us. It's crazy to me. That God commissioned us to partner with him and go reach a lost and dying world and to be a part of the solution. It's crazy. In fact, Matthew 28, we call it the great co-mission. That that's what we're called to do. And yet, if you're like me, and I'm just going to be very honest, it's not my gift mix. It's not my strength. You have insecurities. You feel unqualified. You have a whole bunch of issues that kind of prevent you from sharing your faith, prevent you from reaching out, prevent you from talking about Jesus. You have a whole bunch of issues that are irrelevant when it comes to everything else that is lost, but yet when it comes to God's people, stand in our way. And we are going to look at a passage, Acts chapter 4, that Peter, Peter gives us an insight into what I believe of the expectations that hopefully at the end of this day will free you from all the other stuff about what it means to really reach people for Jesus. So we're going to pick up the story. Acts chapter 4. It says this. They, now i got to pause real quick and say who they is. They are the Pharisees. They are the religious leaders. They are the people who are large and in charge. They run it. They've got all the power, all the influence, all the control. And they have for centuries. They are large and in charge. But Peter, James, John, the disciples, they started this movement. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the Pharisees start to feel that they are losing the grip on power and influence and control. They are losing what they once had. They are losing their status symbol. They are losing all the things that they control and can manipulate. They don't like it. And so they leverage what little control, what little power they have left. And they grab Peter and John. And they throw them in jail. And they're going to quiz them. And they're going to say some stuff. And in this moment, we get an insight into what it looks like to really reach people who are lost and dying. It says this, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So there's 5,000 men, and if you kind of total women and children, estimates are different, but probably 20,000 people. The first church after a few weeks is 20,000 people. That's a big church. It's a movement. And I can't say this enough, that the church in its original state was always about the people, not the building. And we're going to open a building, and I'm so pumped about that. i got to be really, really honest. I'm way more concerned about you and where you're going in life than the building. The church is the movement. It's the people of God. The building's the tool. And we will leverage that, and we will use that. But at the end of the day, 
We are what matter. We are what God cares about. And we are who God will leverage to bring about his kingdom here on earth. And it says that the church is growing because of the message, because of the gospel. And it says this, it goes on. When they saw the courage, that's the Pharisees again. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were, here's the description, unschooled. That's not a very happy word, is it? It's kind of insulting a little bit, unschooled. Ordinary, plain. I mean, if you're on a date, your date looks at you, you like, you're kind of plain. That's not an encouraging word, is it? It's kind of like, it's insulting. Ordinary men, they were astonished that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Here's, here's what they say. They look at the disciples, and, and something so important here comes out. Here's what they don't say. Because a lot of times what you don't say reveals more about what is important to you than what you do say. They don't say, wow, these men are important. Wow, these men are so smart. They are so educated. Whoa, look at how great these men are. These men are so charismatic. No, I get it. I get this movement. No, no, no. They don't say, wow, these men are so amazing and magnificent. No, 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 we get it. No, 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 no. They look at them and go, <laughs> um, y'all are bold, okay? Y'all have courage. Um, we're not sure why, because you're unschooled. You don't have the right education. You don't have the right background. You don't have the right experiences, and you're not gifted in any or talented in any way at all. You're actually pretty plain and ordinary. And yet, it's obvious. It's obvious that you have been with Jesus. Because at the end of the day, when you start to reach out, whatever that is, when you start to reach out to other people, when you start to kind of follow God and pursue God, at the end of the day, when you reach for what God longs for, God, God will replace what you lack. That we are so worried about what we don't have, and I don't have the right answers, and I don't have the right education, I don't have the right background, I don't have the right stuff, I don't have the right... Da, 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 da. It's all irrelevant. It's all irrelevant that God will replace what you lack when you reach for what he longs. And he longs for his people. He longs for the lost. And too often we let the things that we lack intimidate us, disqualify us, and help us walk away from opportunities that God's going, no, 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 if you just trust me, if you just would have courage, if you would just be, in my words, bold. See, we're, we're about to open our building, and we call our campaign bold, and the reason we did, and the th statement that we kept saying over and over again is we believe that you know, God's not looking for people of finances. He's got plenty of finances. Like, God controls all the money in the world. God's looking for people of faith. He's looking for men and women to come together and be bold. And this church was started and this church has grown not on people with finances and people with a whole bunch of influence and really smart people. Listen, I know it. I get to be the lead pastor. It's incredible. I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. I know that. I am an amazing example of God looking and going, I could use you. Yep, no, you're pretty ordinary. That's great. Cool. <laughs> Go. And he's done it over and over and over again. That God, that God will replace what you lack when you reach for what he longs. And for us, we need to move past it. They are not special. They're just courageous. Story goes on now. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They said, listen, we don't care what you do. Okay? We, we just, we, we're losing power. We're losing influence. We don't like it. We don't agree with it. They had some theological issues about whether this Jesus was God or not. I mean, they had some whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of issues about why he couldn't be God, why he wasn't the Messiah. They said, listen, stop talking about that. And then here's what it says. But Peter and John replied, so important, which is right? In God's eyes, to listen to you or to him, you need to be the judge. I believe Peter looks right at him and goes, hey, guys, you're like the religious leaders, right? Uh-huh. You guys are the guys that know all about God, and you studied God, and you got your, all your theology right, and you kind of got it all nailed down right, right? Okay, cool. Hey, quick question for you guys. Um, who should I listen to, you or God? Which was like a trick question for them because, you know, like they're like, we know the right answer is God. But if we say, God, then you might not do what we want to do and the whole deal. And, and he kind of traps them in that moment. But then more than anything, what he says next is so incredibly powerful. What he says next, just every time I read it, convicts me and clarifies for me. 
what is expected of me. He kind of boils it down in the simplest term, and here's what he says. He says, as for us, though, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I believe Peter, and in my version, he sat down. I don't know if he did or not. He sat down, and he looked at those very religious, smart men. He said, guys, hey, here's the deal. I don't have all my theology figured out. I can't debate with you on those issues. I don't have the Old Testament memorized like you do. The Pharisees, they had the Old Testament memorized. Genesis through Malachi. All of it in between. He says, I don't. Let me just tell you something, though. I stood with a guy for three years. And in that three years, that guy predicted his own death and resurrection. And then he did it. Then he came back, and I saw him, and I spent more time with him, and he did more miracles. And I can't debate you, and I'm not going to debate you. And I can't argue theologically with you. I'm not going to argue theologically with you. And I don't have all the answers, and I don't have it all figured out, and I don't have my eschatology and theology and you know, prophet- prophecies. And I don't have all that figured out. I'll just tell you right now, I can't help talking about what I saw and heard. Everything else is just kind of irrelevant to me. So you be the judge. What do you think I should talk about? See, if you're like me, when when I think about sharing my faith, I think about evangelism, everything in me wants to have the right answers and have the right theology and make sure I say the right thing and make sure I don't mess it up and make sure I'm not, I don't look foolish or stupid or whatever. I have all these expectations on myself that, again, as I look at Scripture, didn't come from God, didn't come from anything else, just kind of came from me or somewhere around me or church. I don't know where it came from, but just kind of on me. But I love what Peter says because Peter just drops the mic and is like, listen, all I'm going to talk about is what I've seen or heard. He just kind of drops the mic and walks away. It's like, I don't know about you. I saw a guy raise himself from the dead. I'm with that dude. I don't know how awesome you are. Jesus is bigger. He just walks away. Conversation's over. It's done. I believe if we, if we as a church can adopt this principle, to sit back and remove the expectations that we got to have an education, or we got to be qualified, or we got to have a training class in evangelism, or we got to have a script that we memorize, or we got to have all of it written down, or kind of processed, or kind of figured out for we got. If we could just kind of get rid of all the junk, and just sit back, and when opportunities arise, sit back and go, "Hey, let me tell you what God's done in my life. Let me tell you what I've seen." Let me tell you what I've experienced. I mean, I don't know about your experience. I can't, I can't argue with your experience, but you can't argue with my experience. Can I just tell you what I've ex- experienced? Because people can't argue with your experience. They can disagree with the implications, but they can't argue with it. And for us to sit back and, again, point to God and say, listen, I believe there is a God in heaven who saves people both here and in the afterlife. If we can just do that and not own everything else, not own even the outcome. Because isn't that what happens sometimes? We own the outcome. We want to sit back and we feel defeated and we feel frustrated. We feel like we lost. But Peter doesn't seem to own that. Peter, Peter doesn't own it. Say, listen, yeah, it's my job to convert you. It's my job to train you. It's my job to convict you. It's... No, no, he's like, listen, I'm not going to own any of that. It's God's job to convert you. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict you. Like, no, no, no. all my job is is just talk about what I've seen and heard. All your job, all my job is, is just talk about, hey, listen, I don't know your experience. Let me tell you, when I pray, God answers my prayers. I had an addiction, now I'm covered. I had a marriage problem, now it's fixed. I had a drug problem, it's not fixed. I have, you know, whatever the issues are that we all struggle with. I, I had all these kind of situations. Now, I, listen, I don't know your experience. I'm just telling you right now, God changed me. Can I tell you about that? It just simplifies everything. You don't need to have all the right answers. You don't have, need to have the right background. Matter of fact, the worse the background, the better the story. The worse the problems, the more God gets glory. It just doesn't matter. The, the, it becomes so simple if we can just adopt the practice of, hey, listen, I don't have it all figured out. 
But can I tell you about what I've seen and what I have heard? It's pretty simple. And it gets even simpler. And as I was thinking about it this week, as I was studying and kind of processing it, I believe Peter has this confidence. Peter has this confidence because of something that happened in his past. That there is a story, a different story that I believe Peter was a witness to for some stuff in the text that kind of alludes that he, he, he probably was there. That in the start of Jesus' ministry, in John chapter 1, something happened that I believe Jesus, Peter saw and it influenced him for the rest of his ministry life. We're going to pick it up. John chapter 1. Here's what it says. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so Philip, being a good little new kind of follower of Jesus, he's like, no, 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 no. I'm passionate. I got to reach people. I got to tell people about Jesus because that's what you do. Like you just tell people about things that are exciting in your life. That's what he does. And he does that. And, and I'm sure in his mind, he saw the conversation going very differently than it does here in a second. He thought, man, I'm going to be faithful. Like maybe some of you thought, well, I'm going to invite him to church and they're going to say yes and get saved day one. It's going to be an incredible story. And he did it. It didn't happen. He thought, man, I'm going to invite him. It's going to be awesome. He's going to say yes. He's going to have a great question. It's going to be incredible. It's not at all what happens. He says, hey, I, I, I found the one. Here's the response. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Philip wants to talk about a person. Nathaniel wants to talk about theology. Two very different things. Philip saying, listen, I don't have it all figured out. I have no clue. I just met the dude. Like, but I just saw him put so many fish on a boat that the boat started to sink. I have no clue. Like, listen, I found the one. And Nathaniel's like, well, but theologically, I'm not sure something could come good from Nazareth. And I, we need to talk about that. Da, 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 da. Much like some of you, maybe you've invited him to church, maybe you talked about God, and you had the same kind of juke moment where you're, you're talking about your experience, you're inviting him to a church, and all they want to talk about was, well, why would God allow this, and what about this, and have you ever, and you feel disqualified, and have you ever an answer for this, and you, they start bombarding you with theological questions and things that you may not feel qualified to answer. I don't know what it is. I know I've been there, and how come God would allow, and how come you do, and how come Christians act that way if they're really, you know, just all kinds of excuses, and they Change the conversation. And Philip. Philip says something, again, that I believe Peter saw, that transformed, that transformed how Peter reaches people, that should transform how we see people. And he says this. Come and see. <laughs> Philip looked at Nathaniel and went, dude, I have no clue. <laughs> That's a great question. I, I don't know. I just saw the guy do a miracle on the lake, though, and I can't deny that. I don't know. You just listen. That's a great question. Could we put a pin in your question, and could you just come and see what I have seen? I, I don't know. I don't know is one of the best statements Christians should adopt. For too long, Christians have walked around with a sense that they have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. I, I have been to seminary. I have my MDiv. I promise you, there is more that I say I don't know about than I say I do know. I don't have it all figured out. I don't even have close to it figured out. But that should not stop us. See, what Philip does, what Peter does, says, listen, you just come and see it. I can't, listen, you can't deny my experience. I saw this dude do something. I saw what he did. On this lake, I saw him come and see. And as a church, my hope and prayer is that we would be a come and see church. That as you invite people, and I hope you do, as you kind of invite people, and they have questions, well, why would God and whole deal, and I heard about your church, and I heard about your pastor, I heard he's super sarcastic, to which you could say, yes, he is. You know, I heard he does this, I heard he talks too fast. Mm-hmm, sometimes, yeah, he gets really excited. You know, I heard da, 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 all the issues, all the struggles, all the problems, all the things that kind of come up, all the reasons. I just, my hope, my prayers, you don't have to feel like you got to answer him. You just go, yeah. I don't know. I just go to that church, and man, it's crazy what God's doing, and it's growing, and people's lives are changing, and, and man, God's spirit's there, and marriages are being fixed, and addictions are being overcome, and lives are being changed, and I, I don't know about your questions. I don't, I don't know, but you just got to come see this church. Something crazy happened, and God's doing something incredible in it. Would you just come and see? I'll tell you. 
If you can adopt that, it's the most freeing feeling in the world. Because at the end of the day, what I believe is that we, we don't have to own the outcome. We just have to be willing to witness. We don't have to own the outcome. We want to own it. We want to get defeated when they don't show up or when they don't get converted, when they don't do whatever, not convicted or whatever. I, I realized a long time ago, I can't convict anybody. That's why when people walk out of my sermons, they're like, I don't really got much out of that. Not your issue, not mine, you know. I just, I, I don't know about that. You just, you know, can we go deeper? No. Can, you, can we do? No. I just, no, I'm not going to own the outcome. Nick, why don't you ever talk about this topic? I don't know. I just, I don't feel a need to. It's not my job to convict people. It's not my job to change people. It's my job to be faithful, to be a witness to what I read in Scripture, to what I understand theologically, and to what I have experienced personally, and to let God take care of the rest. That, that is what we are called to do, to bring passion to our pursuit of Jesus and reaching a world that is lost and dying. And you don't have to feel qualified and you don't have to be educated and you don't have to have the best background and you don't have to be perfect right now. All you have to be is willing, willing to witness to a God who did something incredible in your life. Here's what I want you to do this week. Three things. Number one is this. Pray for opportunities. Would you just pray for opportunities? Would you just, listen, maybe you've never done this. Maybe you've never thought about it like this. Maybe this is all brand new information. You've just kind of never processed evangelism this way. You thought you had to do Romans Road and talk about their sin and talk about all their problems and, you know, kind of pray a prayer of salvation with them on a napkin or what. I don't know what your experience is. That was my experience growing up. So anyway, uh, got a little personal there. Okay, sorry. But I don't know what yours is, but, but would you just be willing to go, God, listen, I don't even know what it looks like. I feel so inadequate. I feel like I don't have a clue. I don't have the answer. I don't have the background. I don't have the experience. God, would you just give me an opportunity to talk about what you've done in my life, though? Would you give me an opportunity to talk to other people about what you've done in my life? Would you just give me an experience? Experience to reach out, to partner with you. This is an incredible, incredible, I believe, right that we get to share Jesus with other people. Would you just pray that? Number two, would you just talk about him? Would you just find one person this week? One person. Because here, here's what I know. Come on, let's be honest. You, you're passionate. You have no problem if you're a guy probably talking about UK basketball, right? Or Louisville basketball. Maybe not Louisville. They're not very good. But anyway, UK, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Relax. Oh, whoa. People started flashing signs. It's crazy. Okay, anyway, just kidding. See, you're passionate. That's my whole deal right there. Like, <laughs> You know, like, you have no problem. When I can stand up there and be like, Jesus isn't God, you'd be like, eh, maybe. So many men are more passionate about their basketball game than they are about a God who saves them. And they will throw down and argue with people in grocery stores. I have seen it about the dumbest, stupidest, most temporal, idiotic things in the world. And yet, Scripture says we are living in a world that is like, it's like a breath. It's like a vapor. Like we're here a minute and we are gone. And we miss it. Would you just talk? Would you just talk with somebody about what you should be supposedly passionate about? What God's done in your life. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It doesn't have to be articulate. It doesn't have to be educated. It's just got to be your experience. What you've seen. What you've heard. And would your passion line up with what you're passionate about with other things? Last one is this. Invite others to see and hear about him. Now we're open a church in three weeks. July 1st. Would you just start inviting people like crazy? And again, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to, you don't have to know what we believe theologically. It's on our website. You can check it out. You don't, have to, you don't have to be able to articulate everything. You don't have to be able to defend us. You don't have to be able to do anything. Just sit back and go, hey, would you come to my church? We're opening a brand new campus July 1st. It's going to be incredible. We've got a whole bunch of new seating, new stage, new auditorium, everything like that. Would you just come? And when they ask questions, when they talk about, you know, whatever, when they sit back and I ask you about, well, why would God do it? Just, you just sit back and you just go, oh, yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. Just come and see. Just come. I, I, just, I can't explain it all. I don't have all the answers. I don't have it all figured out. I don't, I don't know. I just, I know it's changing me. I know it's helping me. I know that, man, I just I show up and God's presence is here. It moves me. So I don't have it all figured out. I just want to invite you. I want to invite you to experience what I experience. To come and experience a God who loves me, cares for me, and is recklessly 
relentlessly pursuing me. That's what I want to challenge you to do this week, the next few weeks, as we get ready to launch our new campus. Now, a couple months ago, I was, I was sitting around and my wife had a meeting. It was about 12 o'clock, I think. It was a lunch meeting. And she, start, she realized she lost her keys. She couldn't find her keys. So what do you do when you can't find your keys? You start to look for them. And, and there's a progression. Like, if you've ever lost your keys, isn't there like a progression? It's like a bell curve kind of a deal. You know what I'm saying? Like, at first, you're kind of like, oh, I can't find my keys. And then 30 seconds later, you're like, everybody stop what they're doing. Finding keys, you know? And, and so my wife has this bell curve art progression of of anxiety of I can't find my keys I can't find my keys I can't find my keys and, and man if I was if, if, if we did not have a church where I feel safe and like I could trust you I would lie about this but I feel safe and I feel like I can trust you so, so as the amazing awesome husband that I am can you imagine what I was doing I was playing a video game <laughs> that's exactly what I was doing that's what I was doing like, and, and if you've been to our house, you're like, we got a couch, we got a TV, and our bedrooms, and you know, so, so my wife like went past back and forth multiple times, and I'm like, you're being kind of rude, actually. You know, uh, I didn't say that, but I thought that. Like, I'm trying to, I've got some important stuff here, you know. And eventually she looks at me, and she gets right in front of the TV. She stands there, and she's like, hey, what are you doing? I need your help. She was 100% right, okay? I was like, yes, ma'am, okay, yes, ma'am, yeah, we got kids. You know, I was like recruiting everybody then. I was like, yeah. And, and, and eventually, finally, we wised up and like, hey, Josiah, that's our two-year-old. Do you know where the keys are? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he had hit him in a box somewhere. He's like, yeah, there they are right there. I'm like, oh, here's a quarter, you know. Uh, and my wife, my wife had great passion for the keys because it was important. To her. I did not. So I'm being honest, while she's important to me, my, I just, for whatever reason, I hadn't risen to that level yet. I had, I, she's incredibly important to me, and what's important to her is important to me. Um, but, but for whatever reason, I just wasn't really paying attention. I wasn't really focused on what she was focused on. I was really kind of self, self-indulged at that moment, wrongly. I just wonder, I wonder how many times God looks at us that way. God looks at us like my wife looked at me and is looking down and going, are you kidding me? What are you doing? Like you're so focused on yourself and you're so focused on your stuff and you're so focused on your problems and you're so focused on who hurt you or who said something to you or what you don't have or what you're going to get or what you're enjoying or your trip or your stuff or whatever. Like you're so focused on you. You've missed We're the lost and dying city right here, and everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. And heaven is real, but so is hell. And we have been commissioned. We get the privilege of partnering with God. That's insane to me. I just think he looks at us sometimes. Because we're like me, we're just not paying attention. It's not because we don't care. It's not because we're rude. It's not because we're mean. It's not because we're heartless. It's just that, can we just be honest? Man, it's really easy for us to kind of fall back into a narcissistic, self-involved world. Today, my hope is, my prayer is that you would partner with me. That you would join this movement. That maybe you've never thought about evangelism. Maybe this way. Maybe you've never done anything. Maybe you've never done this. But today would be the day that you kind of wake up. That you kind of hear God saying to you this morning, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Is it matter? Because this world is temporal and we will be gone soon. But eternity is forever. And we have an opportunity to impact eternity. What we do matters forever. And you don't have to have it figured out, and you don't have to be educated, and you don't have to be qualified, and you don't have to have the best best background. All you have to do is be like the disciples originally, which was just willing. You don't own the outcome. You just got to be willing, sir, willing to witness to what God has done in you. I can't wait to see what God does over the next several months. I can't wait to hear the life change stories. I can't wait. You have an opportunity, like we talked about last week, to write a different story. To 
to allow God to use you in a way that you never thought possible, in a way that maybe you never thought you were qualified for until today. It's going to be incredible. I hope you partner with us. I hope you join us. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for us, and we're going to dismiss. As we, as, as we wrap up, and when I say amen, the band's going to sing a song that they sang beforehand. It's called Reckless. And maybe today as you leave, maybe just pause for a moment. Listen to the words. Because it's so true. That God recklessly comes after us. Recklessly came after you. Aren't you glad? Don't you find peace? Don't you, don't you find solace in knowing you are good with God? Let's be the kind of church that cares about everybody else, not just ourselves. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for what you've done. I'd ask this morning, help us be the church. Not just attend, but to live it. Monday through Sunday, that we, with our words and our actions, we would point to you, that we would point to redemption, that we would point to life change, that we would have stories worth telling, that we would be stories worth reading. Prepare our hearts and our minds for what is next. and Give us opportunities, opportunities maybe like we've never had before to share our experience with you to other people. Let us be passionate about what you are passionate about, God. I love you. We thank you so much for the privilege we get. Amen. God bless. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.